Hello everyone, my name is 4AS and welcome to my channel. Now today is going to be a special 4AS Clips because I want to address something I've heard over and over again during my time studying political science. It's the nonchalant argument that because socialism in the past has had many deaths or has been unsuccessful, then it's a silly idea to contemplate as a modern political system. It's really the idea where the phrase people are more likely to envisage the end of the world than the end of capitalism comes from. Now, I understand the sentiment, but there might be some of you that hear these sort of death slash unsuccessful arguments and go, yeah, I hear you, but there's something not quite right here. And I'm here to vindicate those feelings because of Ben Burgess's book, Give Them an Argument, Logic of the Left. Now, the anti-socialism or anti-communism argument may go something like this. Premise one, socialism slash communism has caused many deaths to occur in the past. Premise two, socialist slash communist societies have ended up failing. Conclusion, there can be no successful society that involves socialism or communism. Before we say anything else, I want to put to the side societies such as China or Vietnam that exist today. Now let's unpack these premises and conclusions, shall we? Premise 1 is obviously referring to a type of Pol Pot or Stalinist Russia here. I'm not here to dispute that a significant number of people died in those regimes directly or indirectly. But the assumption in premise one and the conclusion seems to suggest that the anti-socialist person is referring to the same type of socialism. Let's imagine that a leftist had initially said something like, we need more worker co-ops in society to improve our economic situation. And then the anti-communist objector hits them with premise one, two and the conclusion. Quite frankly, this scenario isn't far from the truth, where I saw someone type out a pretty, pretty sizable death slash unsuccessful rant in response to a socialist talking about the differences between private and personal property. But I digress. What premise one and the conclusion suffer from is what's called the equivocation fallacy. The equivocation fallacy is committed when the meaning of a term is switched in the middle of an argument to create the impression that the premises support a conclusion to which they're actually irrelevant. Here's an example I've seen used in multiple textbooks. Premise one, only man is rational. Premise two, no woman is a man. Conclusion, no woman is rational. As you can see, the original intention of man is fellow man or mankind. The term man is erroneously turned on its head to refer to man in the biological sense, which is irrelevant. Some of you can probably guess where I'm going with this. If you go back to the anti-socialism example, premise one and the conclusion aren't referring to the same version of socialism especially if you consider the socialist is advocating for co-ops, not state authoritarian control. Okay, well, the anti-communists can double down. They can say, so what? Socialism has still failed every time, so your objection is irrelevant. Well, again, we're taking out any of the current communist and socialist regimes from the equation, so let's assume that premise two is 100% factual. Premise 2, in fact, suffers from the appeal to ignorance fallacy. There's also a logical problem. The objection, at least as stated, trades on treating the lack of historical evidence for the workability of economic democracy as evidence that it's not workable. As such, it commits the appeal of ignorance fallacy, the mistake we make when we treat the absence of evidential support for one theory as if it were evidence against it, or even for some alternative view. You could probably still double down and say, so what? 
Well, it's safe to say that the feudal lords during the Middle Ages were pretty comfortable in their thinking that their wealth of harvest and their wealth of land would never end. And for people during that time, you'd be remiss to think otherwise. But feudalism did end, now didn't it? It's a mistake to think that things will continue in perpetuity. So now, let that we've gone over our little thought experiment. Here's the crux of the argument. The anti-socialist is using past behaviour to moralise about future behaviour. In other words, it knocks against Hume's law. Either way, what Hume's law tells us is that a purely descriptive premise, i.e. a premise about relevant non-moral facts, can never give you a good reason to accept a normative conclusion, e.g. a conclusion about what someone should do, or about what actions are right or wrong, or what policies are just or unjust. Unless the descriptive premise is combined with an explicit or implicit normative premise. So even when we accept premise 2 as fact, two descriptive premises do not make a moral-esque conclusion. That's plenty of food for thought if you encounter a naysayer to anti-capitalism. If you thought that was interesting, like, share and subscribe. And remember, folks, to keep thinking and keep learning. Goodbye till next time.